Hi, thanks for joining us. Today we're going to have a look at the LoomPad and its amazing new light field technology that lies underneath. Now I'm not going to be able to show you how it's done. That's a secret with Leah. But I am going to show you what it does. Okay, so let's start with the display. That's where the technology lies. This, uh, according to Leah, uh, is the first light field tablet in the world. It's not the first light field display. The first light field display or other light field displays already exist. In fact, the company itself has already produced a light field display as a predecessor product to this in their mobile phone product. Um, it is also not the first 3D or uh, stereoscopic displays. There have been many stereoscopic displays uh, before this, particularly ones that use headwear glasses. The nice thing about this is that it doesn't need any glasses. But even displays without the use of glasses have also existed previously. Those displays were more of the lenticular technology. What's different with this display here is that this uses the light field technology. The difference is that this can be switched off, whereas the um, uh, lenticular uh, surface, the lenticular displays, basically are permanently enabled in their 3D mode. This display can be switched off so that you can use it as a normal tablet in its high resolution uh, mode and uh, then you can switch it into its 3D mode and view it um, with different views, similar to lenticular technology. Now lenticular technology, uh, for those of you who've seen it, know that when you look at a lenticular display or a lenticular image from a different angle, you get different views. And that's the same with this display here. You look at this from a different angle and you will get a different view. In fact, the display has four different views. So if you view it from here, you'll get a different uh, image to when you view it from here, or a third image from here, or a fourth image from here. Then when you continue to uh, angle your eyes around the display, the images will repeat, just like on a lenticular display. Now I'll demonstrate that. Alright, so it's now in 3D mode, um, and you will see, and have a look at the face that you see on the side here, as I turn this, you'll see four different views. And you will actually then see the face reappear as you, as you turn and see the repeat of those four different views. Right, I'll go back, you'll see it again. So there's four distinct different views. Okay, I've mentioned that there's four views, but in actual fact, the hardware is capable of doing 16 views. There's basically four views in the horizontal direction and four views in the vertical direction. So if I turn this into a different orientation, you'll see that the, um, the image flips. But again, you've got your four different views. If you can see that. And this is now in the um, 90 degree orientated, rotated uh, direction. So the device is physically capable of showing 16 views, 4 times 4. Um, what would be nice is if you had an image and you could tilt it sideways as well as up and down and you would see different images. So the hardware is capable of doing this but the software here is not supporting that and the image itself was not taken with that in mind. But the hardware itself has got the 16 views that uh, make that possible. I think it's time that we now have a look at the detail of this display to see what actually makes this display work. To do that, um, I'll be taking a couple of shots with uh, this camera here. 
I'll put this into macro and I'll take some shots just a couple of millimeters away from the screen to be as close as possible. We'll then do a comparison of what the screen looks like when it's just in a standard mode as it is now and what it looks like when we put it into its light field mode. So I'll be switching it from the 2D mode into the light field mode and we'll then compare the two to see what is the difference and what actually makes this display work. I have now taken the two close-up shots and imported them into Photoshop. I've basically done that so that we can do a like-for-like -like comparison and I've imported them as two different layers. So the layer that you're looking at at the moment is the standard display. It is already a close-up so you're already looking at the display just uh, two millimeters away uh, with, with the camera. Hence the resolution of what you're looking at already looks somewhat pixelated. It is however a very high resolution screen it is a WQXGA, which is 2560 by 1600 pixels. So it is in line with some of the top tablets uh, these days. Now what I'll do is I'll show you what exactly that same image looks like when you switch it into the light field mode. So let me switch on that layer. Okay, and as you can see, there is an obvious difference. So it, it obviously looks quite different to what we looked at previously at this uh, closeness. So one thing that we noticed straight away is that it does look a lot more pixelated. And um, that, is actually, uh, that is actually true. So what you're actually now looking at is a display where, yes, you're looking at it uh, with the light field switched on you're looking at it stereoscopically however the sacrifice that you're making is that it doesn't have the same high resolution anymore that it had before so the view that you're looking at now basically has 1 16th of the resolution because it's generating those 16 views that I talked about earlier and um, hence the resolution is now reduced to 640 by 400 which is roughly what VGA resolution is. If you recall uh, from uh, earlier displays, the VGA resolution, which is 640 by 480 pixels. You have to remember though, that you're only looking at one view at the moment. There are 16 views still there, but they are uh, at uh, different viewing angles. So we're only seeing one viewing angle. There are actually 16 other images and 16 other viewing angles that also have um, an image. And that in total obviously brings back the complete resolution of that display. Okay, so what I'll do now is I will zoom in uh, so that you can see what it looks like even from closer. Um, let me do one more. All right, now you can actually see individual pixels here. And uh, the reason, as I said, that I've put this into Photoshop is so that we can morph between the standard view and this light field view. And uh, I will now do that. So I will change the opacity of this layer and bring us back to the standard view just to show that in the standard view we have the same pixels. All right? You can see that there is the same pixels, but here in the standard view, all of the pixels are visible. Whereas as soon as we go into the light field view, and I'm going to just start morph across it a little bit more gently, you can see pixels start to disappear and other pixels start to become very bright. In fact, one out of the array of 16 pixels that make up the, uh, the uh, light field uh, is basically now very bright. That's the pixel that is shining towards us. All of the other pixels that you see there are at different angles also shining at you, just not at the angle that we happen to be looking at right now. Okay, so I've actually highlighted uh, just an example of one of these uh, light fields that come out. What uh, area comprises of one single 
what I will refer to as a hoggle. Okay, so this, this green square that you see now, that is what I will refer to as a hoggle. Now a hoggle is a term used in holography to refer to basically the equivalent of a pixel, but a holographic pixel. Now the difference is that a hoggle is a single point from which light is em uh, emitted uh, with different light rays depending on the direction that you're looking at. Whereas a pixel is a point from which the same light is emanated in all directions, right? So in this case here, in this hoggle, in this uh, green square that you're looking at, there's only this upper left-hand corner that is illuminated. So that is the part of the hoggle that is shining at us. If you were now to look at that from another direction, other uh, pixels or another pixel within that array would be shining towards you. So if you look, if you move the display left or right, basically the, uh, the pixels to the, to the right here or to the left here would start to illuminate. If you were to move the display and tilt it up or down, uh, it would highlight pixels underneath or above that highlighted pixel. So that's how it generates those 16 views that uh, this display is capable of, of generating. Now let me just uh, describe for a moment this nature of the hoggle that we're looking at. I will do this by using an animation. And what you see is the 16 pixels. Each of the 16 pixels basically shines into a different direction, just like a torch. They're not overlapping, so you basically, when you're looking at one pixel, you will not see another pixel shining at you. It's only ever one pixel that shines at you at any given time. As can be seen as you're moving through this hoggle in different directions. And as I've stated earlier, only four views are generated. So even though there are 16 pixels, only four views are generated. And I've represented that by the four different colors that you see here. So as you can see, the first column although comprising of four different pixels, all of those are part of the same view. Likewise, with the second column, the yellow column, there's four pixels, but they all represent the same view. So we're familiar with a image being rotated when we rotate uh, the orientation of our tablet. That is quite normal behavior. But in addition to that, the hoggle behavior needs to change here as well, so that the columns become rows and the rows become columns again, in order to retain the vertical autostereoscopic effect. Now what's worth noting here is that that is not possible with a lenticular display. So this is where the power of this type of display comes into play. That orientation or that change of the hoggle as you change your orientation um, cannot be achieved when you rotate a lenticular lens because the lens is fixed. Let's talk about another important topic, that of crosstalk. Have you noticed that when we looked at the simulation and at the close-up image that there is a pixel that is shining towards you? The other pixels, however, are still visible, much dimmer, of course, but not totally black. That is called crosstalk or ghosting or leakage. It is how much of the unwanted neighboring view is leaking into the one that you are viewing. Now, crosstalk is an important consideration when assessing stereoscopic viewing. Let me show you why. So we've got a pixel here in a hoggle. And that pixel is intended to be the view for the left eye. And then we've got a, another pixel here. And that one is the view that's intended for the right eye. Now what actually happens is that um, there are some of the light that crosses over into the left eye 
that is intended for the right eye and vice versa. There's some light from the left eye that crosses over into the right eye. And that, my friends, is called crosstalk. That is cross talk. Or ghosting, as it's sometimes referred to. And uh, what we want to assess is how much of that crosstalk or ghosting takes place uh, in a display. Now, if you have crosstalk, what that basically means then is that if you only had crosstalk, then you would see a blur of just two images. And if you don't have any crosstalk, then you see crystal clear stereoscopic uh, imaging. And reality is that you will have uh, something in between, and hopefully uh, you'll have something that is on the side of having as little crosstalk or ghosting as possible. So the way we're going to assess this is we're going to have a um, image that we use for the left eye, just with horizontal lines. And then we're going to have another image uh, for the right eye that's going to have vertical lines. So when we view an image from the left eye, we should only see horizontal lines and no vertical lines. If we do see some of the vertical lines, we know we have some crosstalk. And vice versa, we're going to be looking at the right eye, and we're going to hopefully only see vertical lines. But if we see any of the horizontal lines, then we also know that we have some crosstalk. And uh, the way we're going to do that is we're going to take a photo from the left eye. Uh, that's going to be image one. And we're going to see how much of the vertical lines we see. As I've said, we'll do the same thing from here. But I'll also take one from here. So I'm going to take a third image, a, 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 th a third photograph. And um, we're going to have it somewhere in the middle in order to see how much um, we're going to have crossover from one view into the other uh, as we're crossing from one view into the next. So uh, with that, let's have a look. So as you can see, there's very little crosstalk for the left eye. And switching across to the right eye, you can see that there's also very little crosstalk. This is just a close-up. So now let's have a look at what happens in transitions. So the distance from here to the display is about 40 centimeters. And uh, starting with the horizontal line, I'm now moving the display across until only the vertical lines are visible. Of course, if I go further, again, the horizontal lines appear and so forth. Okay, so we've talked about crosstalk or ghosting. Let's now move across to talking about the ideal viewing distance from the, uh, from the tablet. Now, what I've already pre-drawn here is the four views that you get that emanate out of the uh, loom pad. So let me just label them. So you've got one, two, three, four views that come out. Now they don't span um, from edge to edge. Uh, basically you have repeat patterns as I've indicated before. In, in fact, from here to here, you've got two repeat. You've got two repeats. And again, from here to here, you have another two repeats. And uh, so basically all up from edge to edge, you've got five repeats. And we're going to be centering our discussion here on the central um, repeat. So the third one from the edge. Each of those here is nine degrees apart. And um, when you start viewing one of those, you basically uh, are going to want to have your eyes so that one eye is in one view and the other eye is in the other. So ideally, 
what you would like to have is one eye say in here and the other eye you would like to have in here and then you can see stereoscopically now as you move across obviously that will transition from say view two and three to three and four and so forth um, but what I'm representing here is just one of those cases now if you are looking too close at the display this is what's going to happen your eye is going to be down here you're going to be close to the display and your other eye is going to be here and you're basically going to have one eye in view one and the other eye in view three that's not what you want it will still be stereoscopic but you're going to basically skip a view and that will uh, produce somewhat undesirable viewing uh, a you have less views to go through uh, before you have your repeat and uh, also it will create a stronger um, a stereoscopic effect it will basically have a larger parallax um, on the other hand if you're too far away and for this I'm going to extend the uh, the view that you see here so I'm going to in this case just show this one a little bit longer and uh, do the same thing for this one here all right so if you're now going to be too far away then you have the possibility that both of your eyes are just within one view and then again you don't see things stereoscopically at all you basically see things in 2d um, so you've got those cases and you want to be in that sweet spot um, basically between uh, the bottom case and um, this top case here so this range here is the sweet spot for viewing now what I've observed is that uh, that is somewhere between 200 millimeters and 400 millimeters for this display okay let's summarize then in the marketing you would have seen this image of the loom pad where you have this flower and as you rotate this from edge to edge you see that flower pop out of the screen you see it in in 3d and you see this really smooth transition as it goes from one edge right to the other now is that reality is that is that what you see when you when you look at the loom pad and you rotate it between the views not really um, you, you definitely have those four distinct views that I've been talking about does that mean the marketing material is, is wrong? I wouldn't say so. It's, it's a struggle that uh, marketers have with 3D material and you see it with 3D movies where you know a shark comes out of the screen and goes beyond the boundaries of, of the screen. We all know that's not reality, but how else do you show that something is stereoscopic 3D? So from a marketing perspective, I think we have to give that license that yes it, it pops out of the screen but is it smooth like that is it is it from edge to edge one transition that uh, that has that smooth motion not really you definitely have repeat patterns as you move through those four views several times okay the the uh, other thing that we had a look at is the distance from the screen a comfortable viewing distance um, now can multiple viewers really look at this I would say you'd have to be pretty close to the screen that that distance between 200 millimeters and 400 millimeters in order to be in that in that sweet spot of getting the full uh, stereoscopic holographic effect now is that the realistic distance that multiple people would be looking at a screen possibly not does that mean that multiple people can't look at this I wouldn't say that either I think that even if you were to be a meter away and if you happen to be in that sweet spot you just catch that 3d or you may not be and you won't catch it but it's still a, a screen that allows you to 
have uh, the ability to share the content with multiple users. So then, in the end, what do I think of the LoomPad tablet and what it can offer? I have to say that I think it's a truly remarkable display. It is incredible what it offers. So despite some of the limitations that I've been talking about during the video, you have to remember that we are at the frontier of a new generation of technology that is coming out with uh, these type of light field displays. We're at the beginning of, of that new technology trend. And as such, being one of the first tablets or one of the first displays to come out with this technology, it is truly remarkable what this display can offer. From a price perspective, I would say it is reasonably priced. It is no different to other premium tablets that you can get on the market these days. In addition to that, you get a uh, auto stereoscopic display that allows you to, without glasses, without any headwear, see true stereoscopic imaging. It is, like I said, a truly remarkable display. Thank you for watching this video. Keep well and God bless.